you are just joining us on Facebook, I'm Lauren Van Hamer from RDU on stage, and I am with Gary Anderson, who's the producing art producing artistic director, right, of of Plowshares Theater in is it in Detroit? The theater company. Yes, the theater company is in Detroit. In Detroit, and um, I I. Gary and I connected because I've been trying to educate myself about Black theater and happened on your website, Black Theater Matters, um, which I will put a link to Great. Uh, when we post this video, but it's a wonderful resource. So that's Thank how you. we connected. Um, if you have any questions, be sure to put them in the um, comments section and we will try to get to them. But Gary, I want to start with kind of the um, theatrical landscape of what is happening um, in Michigan and your city. Can you paint a picture of what the theater landscape looked like prior to COVID-19? Yeah. Um, um, Detroit and Michigan in total is um, home to a number of community theaters. In fact, we have a large, we supposedly, according to the Guinness World Book of Records, Michigan has the largest number of community theaters of any of the 50 states. So there's a lot of appeal for theater across the state. Um, a number of our theaters are, are professional theaters, the theaters that actually pay a salary. Uh, they are smaller, SPTs. That we only have one Lort theater, uh, the League of uh, Resident Theaters, the largest theaters in the uh, country. We only have one of those. That's not in the city of Detroit, actually. It's outside in the suburbs, mm -hmm. and it's on the, the campus of Oakland University in Oakland County, which is the northern suburb from, from Detroit. And it's, it's Meadowbrook Theater, and they are a Lort D, which is the fourth and final um, classification. So A is the top, which is the largest theaters. D is the smallest. So um, mm -hmm. that's where we stand. We have a number of, we don't, so if you're looking at the ecology of the theater com community here, we ha don't have a lot of mid-sized theater companies. So that's a challenge. So you have a small groups that are usually under two to three million dollars or, or even under a million and you have you have the Lord Theater, and then you have academic theaters and community theaters. Right, right. And there's a lot of good work. There's a lot of um, workshops and um, interesting work coming out of Michigan. I know Birthday Candles, which was supposed to make its debut on Broadway in April. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was workshopped first at Chautauqua and then at a theater in Detroit. So um, lots of good work, exciting work. Um, according to the American for the Arts Impact Survey, mm -hmm. it's interesting because some of the data from Michigan mirrors some of the data from North Carolina. Oh, really? Um, the, the numbers are bigger in Michigan. The total economic impact is bigger, but the percentages are similar. So mm -hmm. According to that survey, here and there, 45% of the arts organizations in your state may not survive this pandemic, according to that survey. That's a real um, likelihood. Is that consistent with what you're hearing? That's, that's, it's not just consistent with what we're hearing. We're also consistent with the um, fears and anxieties. The, um, the ecosystem is fragile. There's not a whole lot of stability. You don't have a number of theaters that have uh, uh, endowments or or even cash reserves on which they could they can survive. And so, and, and people are basically living hand to mouth. And so, it becomes challenging. Very challenging um, for all our arts organizations. But I wonder. You wrote a really um, beautiful blog post, um, and I hope people will go to Black Theater Matters website and to the Plowshares website and read um, some of the blog posts that you have been posting. Um, 
we already know that the virus is having much more significant impact on our black communities um, than our white communities. But you also wrote that the racial inequality in the country extends to our arts and culture community, the economic form of inequality, and I'm quoting this from the post, is the knee on the neck of arts organizations of color. So funding's an issue on a good day, <laughs> right. pre-pandemic. Is the pandemic affecting our arts organizations of color more significantly? Absolutely. Than... Be again, because of the same circumstances, you don't have the cash reserves. You uh, I did a survey, the Black Theater survey about four years ago, looking at the theater as it was 2016, 2017. I released it in 2017. And I really looked at African-American theaters in this country, looked at my original intent was to research all of these companies. That's how the list came into being um, because I was looking for individuals who I could interview and meet with to find best practices, things that actually worked that were most successful, and also look at where they were challenged and see what they have done. They had done to overcome those challenges. And and what the what my survey brought clear to me was that many of the challenges I was having here in Detroit were replicated at other theaters around the country, regardless of size, structure. Examples like. Um, the, the vast majority of uh, theaters that I surveyed, they had 10% 10, 10 or less of their operating budget came from individual giving, which is unlike most white regional theaters. Um, they had over time reduced the amount of investment in play development, which correlates with the rise in certain plays, certain types of plays being developed at white institutions. Perfect example, between 19, the 1960s and um, roughly into the early 90s, the majority of plays by African-American writers that were presented on Broadway either had a co-producer from a black theater company or were exclusively produced by a black theater company. I'm talking about, you know, the Negro Ensemble Company, the New Federal Theater, Crossroads Theater Company. These are examples of what I'm talking about. You know, plays like Spunk, uh, Color Music. Th that's what I'm talking about being brought to New York theater. Um, today, in fact, the 20th, 21st century, since 2001, every Black authored play that's been on Broadway has come through a white institution. Even if the, the, there's only two that actually were originally developed at black theater companies, but when they got to the point of bringing the show to Broadway, those black theater companies were not recognized. They were not associated with them in any kind of financial connection. And so different from when Woody King Jr. took for colored girls to Broadway in partnership with the public theater, New Federal was a partner in that production. Woody King Jr. got recognized. His company was recognized. That was only four years after it had been established. That's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to tell you. Um, Crossroads with the works of George C. Wolf, those works elevated the company to a national standard. In fact, they eventually ended up taking his work overseas, finding partners in the UK. So that's what that that's what that establishment that kind of imprimatur does for the black theater today none of that is occurring so you have writers like Lydia Diamond um uh Dominic Morriso all coming through white institutions before their shows get to Broadway and so there's so that that disconnect um we we end up finding ourselves be in a situation where the black theaters are not necessarily recognized as they once were and I think that part of what we need to do now is reclaim that that responsibility and actually get get back into the point of developing works that can eventually end up in in New York, either off Broadway or on Broadway. In fact, that's one of the things Plowshares is doing. We're developing a play right now just for that very purpose. 
I'm excited to see it um, because I I wonder, you know, prior to this pandemic, this season we saw the success of Slave Play um, mm -hmm. on Broadway. We saw Tony Stone, which is getting recognized in the Antonio Awards and some of these uh, drama desks. Do you think that the success of those productions will open the door to more Black theater production companies producing work on Broadway on that mainstream stage? I don't want to. I don't want to speak ill of, of other people, and so I don't know if those writers are ever going to associate themselves with a black theater company, um, mm -hmm. or in strong or in a at a certain level. I think early on in her career, Lydia Diamond did work with African American theaters. In fact, when she was in Chicago, she had close association with a number of black theater companies. We were able to do a premiere of, of her play, The Bluest Eye, here in Detroit, and we're very proud that we were able to do that. Um, but there comes a time when, in, in the case of certain writers, and this is a more recent occurrence, I don't know necessarily if this was always the way it, it was, but there comes a time when writers find themselves only want, wanting to exclusively work with organizations that they think can bring the money to them. And so, um, as the assumption is, that Black organizations can't always do that. And, and this is not just on them. When we got introduced to August Wilson, we got introduced to August Wilson through Yale, and, Ye and Lloyd Richards at the time had associations with not Black companies. He took those he took those plays to all these white regional theaters around this country. And so when they got to Broadway, the list of producers had places like Huntington, like the Goodman, the Arena Stage, all associated with the success or failure of those shows. There was no black company associated with those productions. So I'm not so I'm not just blaming recent writers. I'm saying this has been a problem that's been developing since the mid 80s. I, I feel like we're in some sort of, um, I keep seeing it called a tectonic shift in the last couple of weeks, and I hope it's a um, permanent shift um, where a lot of our Black artists, particularly Black artists who have been on Broadway, um, are speaking out and circulating petitions. Do you think that we're going to see a, a shift on Broadway? after this is over, once we get past what we're going through now, this historic moment? I don't really know. And to be honest with you, the reason why I'm hesitant to be optimistic is because the concerns and and, and, and wants that Black artists are, are asking for now are the same that were being asked by artists in, the, in 1920, are the same that were being asked of artists, Black artists in New York in the 1820s, L a little history point. So 1821, there was a black theater company that was developed in New York of freed, Af freed blacks named the African Grove Company. They played at African Grove, which was a, a space that, that was being used. They did, they did the first black authored play that was ever produced in this country play called King Shot Away by a Mr. Brown, who was the manager of the company. They got shut down in 1823 based almost exclusively on negative reviews written by a guy named Mordecai Noah, who was the first Jewish writer in this country to be taken seriously as a prominent writer. And he wrote, he, 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 he was a playwright, he was a critic and he attacked the, the validity of black rock actors, of Negroes being actors. The last show, the show in fact, that the police shut them down doing was where they're, they were gonna do all black production of Richard III, Richard II, excuse me, Richard II, that, um, uh, that was shut down. There was some competition down the street at a legitimate theater. There was Edmund King about to do the same show. And, and one of the things that the African Grove Company had been able to do is cultivate an audience. 
a, a an audience of whites as well as blacks. But the fact that they were, sh but they were, they were ridiculed by critics, and then they were basically forced out of existence by the police. So, those are the, the those circumstances are no different than the circumstances that Griffin Matthews talked about in his video. They're no different than um, uh, other comments that have been made by some of these other other artists. So why are we 200 years away from that time period and still talking about the same circumstances? So you understand now why I'm not I'm le I'm less willing to be hopeful that this is a different time. Well, and I love I mean one of the things I really took away from the blog post um I and I don't know if it's the most recent blog post but maybe it is um is that th this none of this is new. Um right. This, I mean, you pointed to that this is all happening around the the 99th anniversary of what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, yeah. Uh, 35th anniversary of another police brutality incident. Yes. So this isn't right. new, and yet people are acting like this. This is the moment that things are going to change. And I'm kind of with you. I'm a little less optimistic. This, this is what I need to have some optimism at. This, this is a moment that's an inflection point. I need to hear people coming up with strategies that are actually completely different than what we've done before. Perfect example, I think that we have a tendency to beg a seat at the table for with white artists, with white theaters. And so it's as if they let one or two of us through the front door and the rest of us are sitting there desiring a, a seat. Um, I don't believe that that's the most effective way to develop a culture of artists. Mm -hmm. Letting somebody else decide the fate of your artists is antithetical to your voice being developed in an unfiltered, uncompromised manner. There are a group of artists here mm -hmm. who have called on their fellow Black artists to divest from arts organizations that are predominantly white. Is that the answer to develop that culture that you're talking about? I tell you this, and we didn't get into it beforehand, but so that, that comment I made about the knee on the neck of our institutions of color, 58% of all arts funding in this country goes to the top 2% of arts organizations. So 60 cents out of every dollar goes to two people. <laughs> Think about that. That's what we're talking about. If we're talking about it in the context of, and that means that the other 42% is being fought over by 98 people. You see what I'm saying? So as long as that horrid, disproportionate, and inequitable funding system exists, we can't fix the problem. Because I, as an artist, will be asked to, as a, as a, uh, as a artistic leader, I'll be asked to be more fiscally responsible and manage my money right and talk about sustainability. When in fact, the, the ones that they cite as most sustainable are being sustained by this massive amount of arts funding that is disproportionately presented to them. Um, and the and no offense, but the complexion of those organizations is amazingly similar. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I, so what I, we're talking about here is we, ca we can't have an honest conversation about things changing unless we divest, unless we defund that the current system and we try to find a way of redistributing those resources in a far more equitable way to all the artists that work, because the system that we have now assumes that the decisions are made exclusively by merit, and they're mm -hmm. not. And our arts organizations, specifically in theater over the last 30 years, our arts funders have tried to diversify our largest white cultural organizations with mm -hmm. grants 
going for cultural participation and diversity and equity inclusion and multiculturalism. They've changed the names, but the programming has basically been the same. And what we found, and again, this is another thing I found in my research, that in 1989, roughly 73% of all art jobs went to whites in this country. Guess what it was in 2017? <laughs> it was basically the same number. Is it say the same or less? <laughs> so basically what you have is in a 30 year period after all these funding initiatives to try to encourage, basically extort arts organizations to change their boards, change their staffs, change their programming, change their audiences, you found that nothing really dramatic has happened. When there have been dramatic shifts and then the, fund, the, the, the foundation funding leaves, the programming leaves. Mark Taper Forum was, was one of those that was part of an initiative that Lila Wallace uh, did several years ago um, where they came in and said that 3% of their audience was uh, Latinx and that they wanted to at least double it over the next five to seven years. And so what they did was they actually, they actually produced plays by Latin <laughs> playwrights, number one, and they did them on a consistent basis. And they did other programming to, incult, uh, to cultivate that audience. Okay, so they get to the end of the funding of that program that was paid by Lila Wallace and they stopped. And when you look at the demographics of their audiences since then, you see that it's like a hard stop. It's like a wall is shut down. The moment they stop getting a check, the programming changed, the, uh, that audience dissipated because what they had been able to do is raise it to almost six, they almost doubled it. They got up to, in the seven years, they got it to 5.6%, which was, which was close to their goal. But on, at the end of that grant program, they just, they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't find the desire to invest it anymore because they didn't have the resources. So my argument is, as opposed to giving, it, giving money to people whose desire is on, to do it is only connected to the check that is presented, why don't you support an institution whose very mission it is to give voice to that community? I, I, it makes complete sense to me, actually. Um, and, and we've seen that here where theater companies are giving grant money because they say they're going to do one or two productions right. or programming that, you know, and the grants are contingent upon that. Uh, I, you mentioned theater critics um, back in the, mm -hmm. this, this Jewish theater critic back in the 1800s. Um, be, having with the, the power of the pen to shut mm -hmm. down that theater company. Um, I know there are some productions, there was a production in Canada um, by an indigenous playwright and she put out one request. Her request was that only critics of color review her work. Um, I know being a critic myself, it is very difficult to um, objectively, nobody's objective, but to kind of go into um, a performance where you have no connection in, in your life experience to what is happening and be able to fairly evaluate that play, mm -hmm. that piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of the coin, we have very few critics of color. So how do we nurture new writers of color who want to be theater critics and can go out and do these, cover these productions for us? So I'll answer that by taking it out of theater and showing you an example of how you do this. So someone was trying to figure out why spelling bees of the last several decades have been won by uh, young people of Indian descent or Asian descent, right? Mm -hmm. Why were they overwhelming, considering the percentage of the population that they make up in the United States, why were they fairly consistently winning these, 
these competitions. And they figured it out. It wasn't because they were better. It wasn't necessarily because they were better educated. It wasn't necessarily because they had a tiger mom that was really pushing them. It was the fact that those kids saw somebody who looked like them winning. And so they said to themselves, I can do that. So if you want critics of color, you want Hispanic and Latino critics, you want black critics, you want Asian critics, you have to show them. You have to see them visibly. You have to, exp you have to expose the world to them in such a way that they, they are prominent and, pe other, and then other folks like them can see that as a possibility. <laughs> But, but to assume that these things, these flowers grow uncultivated is just ridiculous. Yes, I agree. And um, I, you know, we have been trying in my organization to nurture young artists of color who want to be writers and say, yeah. hey, if, we will help you. We'll, you know, we'll give you the platform to write. Not that we're so visible, but it's a well, start. Well, well, here's an example. <laughs> my, 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 in my hometown, I'm not originally from Detroit, but in my hometown, Ypsilanti, the guy who did the theater critics was the farm reporter before that. The, in Detroit, the, one of the longtime theater critics, again, was not somebody who was educated in theater. Sometimes you could say it reflected itself in his critics criticism, <laughs> but... Um, he was somebody who had been an expert writer, a beat writer as a, in a, in a newspaper, you know, since he was, was a cub reporter. So he understood the craft of writing a story and conveying information to an audience. And what the, and whether the, the newspaper wanted to or not, they invested in him being able to learn the craft. And so I would instead look at journalism programs or creative writing programs or technical writing programs and look for people of color in there and, and expose them to the possibility of having an opportunity to write a, criti a criticism based on exposing them to the art form and giving them a, a, a basic information about what it is. Because what you want is you want somebody to be able to articulate competently to an audience that's not seeing a production what, what that show is about. So you want a good writer first off. Absolutely. And one thing that really surprised me, I did an interview earlier this week with um, Nicole M. Brewer, who has some creative training programs and teaches practice of anti-racist theater. And mm -hmm. one thing I mentioned in that interview, which I didn't know, is there's no historically black colleges that have a master's in theater program. I didn't, I didn't know that. But no, they all have undergraduates. They're all bachelor's programs. Yeah. Yes. So, and, and she was saying this systemic, this built-in racism into our theater industry starts at the educational level. It, it, that's where it's all cut, you know, and she used that as an example. Well, here's, again, this is another example outside of the theater. Think about every high school that still has sports as a part of their extracurricular activities. Think about the fact that every college has their best players, right? They have their kid that somebody just looks at who thinks, oh, he's the next LeBron, he's the next Jordan, right? Well, what happens is they, if they, if they can find resources, they go to college and they get on a team with all the other Jordans and LeBrons that were there. And what then happens is a culling process. Mm -hmm. So that when you get to the NBA, you basically in many cases have called out all the people who were very good, but they just didn't have that, that last bit to make it over there. We, don't act we act as if that's not a really good way of of looking at how we approach the development of writers creative writers creative artists of every field that we think seriously about getting them in a pool it because we used to invest in what my wife and i talked about we used to invest in the public good 
We used to think that arts and culture were part of the, the regular curriculum that you exposed young people to as they matriculated because it taught them humanity, right? You do not have the capacity for understanding someone else until you have been exposed to their stories in a real sense. And that's what we've divorced us. This has happened on my watch, my generation's watch. I've, I've told this to people before that we, my generation, people of my age have been the ones who were from pre-K till the day we walked out of our high school with our diploma in integrated spaces. And the assumption was that a close proximity between pe black people, brown people, white people, Asian people was going to develop this society that was far more tolerant and accepting of one another. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a false premise. I think, I think we asked integration to do something that it was never going to be capable of doing. Um, because the classmates that I went to high school with helped defund public education. They helped create the, the school choice um, system, which really destroyed the sources of funding. They've assisted in removing property taxes as a way of paying for education. And they have destroyed, destroyed other fabrics, the elements of the public good, so that we no longer have arts as part of your regular study from K through 12. It's true. And that's the reason why we have the world. That's why people are on the streets today. That really is part of it. It's not the <laughs> whole thing, but that definitely is part of it. I, what is this in, in your research and your website didn't pop up two weeks ago. Your website has been the Black Theaters Matter, Black Theater Matters website is what I'm talking about. It right, right, right. started in 2016 right. um, as a resource. What is the state of Black theater in this country and how does that compare to other countries? I think I think the state of black theater is strongest here. I, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's stronger in the UK, and I don't think it's stronger in Canada, and I know it's not stronger in the Caribbean. Um, it's the strongest it is here because of the volume that still exists, because of the number of space of, of theaters that, which is not what it was at one time in the seventies. We had. We had like 600 theater companies around the country that we could name multiple organizations in um, in every state. Um, that no longer exists. Now, again, those theaters ran everywhere between community theaters to non-equity to equity theaters, but they ran the gamut, and they were they were cultivating and, and producing a number of exciting writers that would either stay within their own communities or move to, you know, hot spots like New York, Chicago, LA um, to cultivate themselves or, you know, Philadelphia, DC, wherever they find, they could find themselves working on in it at, at a level that they found satisfying. Um, but a lot of those theaters are no longer in existence. Um, so we now have a universe of roughly eight, somewhere around 80, 90s theaters that that exist at in those varying sizes does it vary region to region i mean your career has taken you cleveland pittsburgh atlanta denver houston now you're in detroit so right. is does it vary region to region are we seeing more black theater companies in smaller regions maybe like the Raleigh-Durham area versus a bigger region like Atlanta, or is it vice versa? How's it working? It's, it's no. It, I'll tell you what it is. It is two things. Um, it is the density of the black community, meaning that how many in close proximity to where you build the theater, how 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 large is the black community? How large is black black population? Secondly it means the resources that you're able to access. And that's from several different sources. That's from individual giving. 
It's from corporate and philanthropic sources and from the government. Mm -hmm. And that's really how, really dictates the health of the organization. So if you don't have all of those ducks in a row uh, and at a level that really helps sustain you, that's when a situation like the pandemic could have could have a, uh, a could deal a death dealing blow to you is what I'm trying to say. In our area, performance space is a premium, and other than our academic institutions, I can't think of any black theaters in the Triangle area that have their own designated space. So in your data, in your data, are you only looking at theater companies that have their own space or all black theater companies, regardless of whether they have their own space or not? It's all, all types of theater companies. In fact, the majority of the theater companies I looked at didn't own their own spaces. Most of them had, most of them rented um, season to season or production to production. Others had long-term um, relationships with specific spaces and the the smallest amount roughly like five to seven percent ha had their own spaces could had a home that they could call their, their own that you know they had a key to it they could walk in anytime they wanted to um, plowshares doesn't have its own space we rent from spaces around Detroit and we've been doing that for like I said 30 years which has had a, a, a negative impact on our growth. Mm -hmm. I, I used to tell people that we've moved more often than Jews in the Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was because we, you know, just like after they get freed from Pharaoh, it took them forever. It took them 40 years to, <laughs> to get to Jerusalem. And what I'm trying to say is that I'm still trying to get there to my Jerusalem. But the... Um, the challenge has been, in large part, trying to find a space that would accommodate both our current needs and potentially our future needs, and also convincing a community that this needs the investment, that this is something vital. Absolutely, and and I, I think I hope one thing that comes out of this moment is that people will recognize that black theaters are viable and that we need to see more of these stories on stage because this is how we, in my opinion, this is how we begin to understand each other. <laughs> right, well, as I said, the arts have, have a humanizing effect to them. So reading poetry, when you read a poem by a, a, a Japanese writer, a child or someone young talking about their lives mm -hmm. and someone in the middle of Okinawa in Hawaii can identify with the experiences. I, I tell this, I teach, I teach performing arts and, and I always tell my students when I'm trying to get them to understand the power of the arts mm -hmm. is that tell me about the time when you, you felt you had some type of feeling, some, some, some longing, some, some passion, some drive that you could not put into words. And then you saw, then you heard a poem or you heard a song and that song, whether it was directly or talking about the situation you were experiencing, it clearly articulated your emotions. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's, that's the power of the arts. That's what the arts are able to do. They're able to communicate how we feel and what we think to people beyond language. Yes. And so that's how we get to a point of understanding. And if we don't understand, we get to a point of compassion and empathy. Yes, yes, that's what theater does. Every single person I interviewed pretty much prior to this pandemic, when I asked what is the importance of arts education or arts in schools or, mm -hmm. or theater, um, almost every single person says it builds empathy, builds the right. empathy muscle that we don't have any other way of nurturing. Right. 
And so imagine, so imagine the world we are living in right now, if we just had a little bit more empathy, yes. right? Yes. Right. Yes. See what I'm saying? So when we have spent since the nineties, cutting out all these funds that were used to be available to schools and other cultural organizations, when we have found ways, when, when, we, when we've told communities the, prop, the property taxes that we take from you don't deserve to go to the school in your neighborhood. It's not good enough for you. <laughs> We've disconnected people's empathy from the other people around them. Mm. And so we're all living in these, if not physically gated communities, we're living in these emotionally gated communities where we no longer see the benefit of the public good. And yes. that's all, and it's all, it's all a piece of what it takes to be part of a civil society. So people can say, and they can think that the arts are frivolous and that they're a luxury and you have to have money or education to understand them. And they don't understand how wrong they are. Yeah. And it's until we, I don't think we're going to see difference in funding until we change that mindset. And I don't know if that comes from voicing our, you know, having our vote matter in elections. I don't know where that comes from, but I, I agree with you. It all comes down to funding. <laughs> I think, I think, I think it's incumbent upon us who actually care about these things, not giving up and, or, or accepting half measures. Because that's what we've done in the past. We have accepted half measures. We've we've asked for. We, we've been talking about trying to get the whole loaf, and what we've accepted is half. We start off with half, and what we end up is getting a third. <laughs> yes. Which is insufficient. Yes. Um, we have a Facebook question from Gregory. He wants to know. Um, do you have a list of the black theater companies that operate their own spaces? I I don't have those delineated specifically, but on my on 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 the Black Theater Matters website, I have them. I have all the art theaters. I have all the black theater producing and presenting companies that I was able to find at the time listed, and I have them broken down between companies companies that actually put on the shows, put up seasons. And I have presenting groups and whatnot. So, like, there there may be a center that that hosts another theater company working in their space. Um, I have also listed solo artists and festivals and ensembles that are connected. So, you may have a, a system like an organization like like uh, Six Five One Arts in New York. Mm -hmm. which is an, uh, does multiple art events. They do music and theater and dance and literature and whatnot, but they do theater. And so I have them listed, but they are a presenting organization. Well, and, and on our website too, we have the presenters and producers. They're all kind of clumped together. Uh -huh. Tough to tease them out, but um, I will put the link to the Black Theater. It's blacktheatermatters.org. Yes. And theater, yes. If theater was with an R-E, Gary. Yes. yes. A great, um, it's a great resource. It's a great yeah. place. And so when you go to the list of Black, there's several different lists, but one of them says Black Theater Company, and then the one says cultural and presenting organizations. A third says solo artists and whatnot. So I have, th those all make up, the universe that we're talking about here. Yes. Um, a lot of our theater companies, I'm sure you've seen, I'm sure you've seen it in um, Detroit. We're seeing it everywhere. They are coming up with these um, messages of solidarity. Um, yeah. Some land a little bit more sincere than others. Mm -hmm. How do our predominantly white theater companies that are coming up with these statements, how do they follow that up with action? They followed up with action. And those actions are, have dollars allocated to them. But in honesty, you know, 
again, like I said, I'm not optimistic about much of this changing the nature of the institutions that currently exist unless outside forces ch make them change mm -hmm. because we've been here before and there is appeasement that occurs, but you, you have to look at it in the totality. Mm -hmm. An organization, a large regional theater, Alabama Shakespeare Festival or the Goodman or whatever, they have a predominantly white audience. They have a predominantly white board. They have a predominantly white staff. They have a predominantly white season of programming. They, they also have a predominantly white funding source, do, individual donors and corporations and whatnot. For them to dramatically become the type of space that is needed to be equitable means that they have to take all of those concerns from all of those sources and deny their being being supportive of that level of privilege mm -hmm. and for the most part folks aren't going to do that and they're not going to do that in a situation with a pandemic like now because it will make them feel threatened for their existence true <laughs> true Right. Yeah. So they're going to continue. To do, they're going, what they're going to try to do is they're going to try to double down on what they've already got established. And they're going to try to pick around the edges to try to do something that looks that some cosmetic change that looks more equitable. Mm -hmm. But that's never going to satisfy you because what you're talking about is there's a whole host of artists, black artists that want a space where their voice can be heard. And they don't want to wait in line while you pick the ones you like and the rest of us don't have an opportunity to do anything. That's just wrong. And so that's why my solution is really to invest in institutions of color, invest in Pergonis Theater in the Bronx, which is a, a Latin theater, Plowshares Theater in Detroit, um, you know, the East West Players in LA, support these institutions and you will be able to change the number, the demographics of our theater field simply by the fact that you'll have these organizations at a stronger level, being able to pre present and produce and cultivate talent that'll go forth and be part of this community, this professional theater community. Mm -hmm. That you can only change the, the demographics of the American theater if you change where the dollars of you know, that fund American theater go, because it's not going to happen otherwise. Yeah, it's true. I I do want to ask you this question. Um, I, in some of the interviews I've done, and this is pre-pandemic interviews mm -hmm. that I've done, um, the issue of colorblind and color conscious, colorblind versus color conscious casting has come. Mm -hmm. And originally, this was the today was going to be a panel about color wine versus color conscious casting. Yeah. Um, and I received some feedback from our community that the, that kind of conversation would be particularly hurtful and harmful mm -hmm. to the theater community, which is <laughs> not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to open the conversation. Right, right, right. Community right. conversation. But I guess because we have a lot of artistic producers and some of them are on with us watching on Facebook um, who, who are white that are using this, I, I keep going back to this term coded language mm -hmm. um, that is hurtful and harmful and they don't even know it. So why are these terms hurtful and harmful to the black community? <laughs> okay, so I was in college when the non-traditional casting project started, um, and it was basically an initiative that was promoted by the Actors' Equity Association because they found they figured out something that was pretty evident to everybody else, specifically members of Actors' Equity, that the majority of jobs that was being cultivated, the contracts for their actors and their stage managers went predominantly to white males overwhelmingly to white males. Um, and they found that 
there all these women and all these uh, these people these people of color who are part of their membership that don't work very often. And so they figured a way that they could help promote greater effort in hiring a black man, an Asian woman, you know, a Hispanic, um, lesbian, whatever, uh, was to co encourage these theaters to do what they were calling non-traditional casting. It's since then been called colorblind casting. Um, and the thing that I always go back to isn't it better that they just do a play with some black folks in it? <laughs> I mean, we always try to find, we come up with these ideas that are these convoluted ways of just doing what we've been doing. So we do King Lear and then we do Death of Salesman and then we do um, Waiting for Lefty and then we, <laughs> then we do the 5th of July. We do all these plays by these right, white male writers and all we, so now what we're going to do is stick some people, some black folks, some brown folks, some Asian folks, and some indigenous folks in them, and that's supposed to work. And I just, I, I'm not into that. Um, I don't. Someone once asked me again when I was in college, did I, was I, was I going to be satisfied only telling black stories? And I said, I looked at them because I was just, I, I was kind of like outdone about that. Because I said, you're going to tell me somebody who has not had all of our stories told or even written down at that point and even explored from all the various perspectives that they can be explored. Am I going to be satisfied by only telling Black stories for the rest of my life? I said, I would have to have six to seven lifetimes to be satisfied. And they couldn't understand that because they come from a position of plenty. They can turn on television and eight out of 10 shows they see reflect them. Or they can go to the movies and nine out of 10 films they see listed will reflect them or pre present, present them in the forefront. And I'm still trying to find ways of putting my story out there in a way where my, my purpose is to be there for African-American people. And I, I know that that sounds, that some people might say that sounds segregated, but the original impetus for the development of black theaters in this country was a call to arms that was done by W.B. Du Bois in the 20s where he said we needed theaters that were by, for, about, and near Black people because representation matters. And, and it's 2020 and representation still matters. And it still matters. Yes, <laughs> right. Um, I, I told you before we went on camera that I went to the National Black Theater Festival last summer. Mm -hmm. I was a little nervous about going and and my initial reason for going was because the theater, American Theater Critics Association was having a mini conference during the Black Theater Festival. That's why I went. Um, now I'm gonna make it a regular practice whether they have a mini conference there or not because it was a fantastic experience. Right. And it's in our backyard in right. Winston. -Salem, so there's no, re there are no excuses not to go. Absolutely. Um, but, one thing that struck me about one of the, I attended one of the workshops and a um, artistic director from a black theater company in Texas, she said, we produce black theater. Eileen um, Morris. Yes. It was the, yes. it was the, the ensemble, ensemble theater. theater. Yep. Ensemble theater. I know her, I know her very well. <laughs> and she said, we don't produce black theater because you know, basically, the, the her her point was that black stories are universal stories. Mm -hmm. There's some piece of the story that you're watching in on stage, even if it's a black play or a play written by a black playwright. There's some piece of this that you're going to connect with, and that's what I took away from that experience because every single show that I saw. I didn't learn something 
but I also could take away something from it that I could relate to. What, in your experience, what would surprise white audiences about Black theater? I think what would surprise them about a number of the plays that I've done is how, how when you actually look at it, you hear the common concerns of humanity being displayed. Um, and it may be with a different dialect. It may be with the trappings changed significantly. The economic levels might be different. Um, the, the way they worship might be different. But what you're really talking about is, is a human being interacting with a society and through this work of art, trying to reflect what they comprehend about their place in the world and the world that they find around them. Um, that's really what it is. Uh, and I hope that's what people take away whenever they see my shows. And, and that's what Eileen was saying, is that there's, you know, the, the, the fundamental themes running underneath the undercurrent of all of these stories is a, a stories that we can all relate to, identify with, understand. It increases our understanding, which is what you and I have been talking about. You have to, well, first of all, before you go, you have to accept the notion that my humanity is as valid as yours. And then if you, if you walk in with that premise, then that means that what you learn through that play are life lessons about humanity that you can connect with in some cases. It might make you question things that you've held in the past. But the point is, is that it is a human engaging with their environment and their place within it. And, but first you have to get to the notion of humanity. You have to believe in that we all have humanity and that, that there is worth in our humanity that is equal, not one is better than the other. Yeah. I, I have several more questions, but we're getting sure. to the end of our hour. Do you have a few extra minutes to spend with sure, me? Sure, sure. I got some time. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to honor your time, but you know, we we went on all these detours because I, I'm and, and I and I'm the I'm I have a tendency to preach, so I don't mean to go on long. I'm enjoying sitting in the Church of Gary right now. So. <laughs> Just want to sit here a little longer, please. Okay. Right. Well, I don't know about that. Okay, well, fine, sure. I'll be happy to help you. Uh -oh. You know, you mentioned the Lort Theater in Michigan. We have a Lort Theater um, in Chapel Hill on the campus of University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And last year, I um, kind of said to the artistic producing artistic director there that I felt that was a community in crisis. Students were tearing down statues. There was a beloved basketball coach that had been fired due to racist remarks. And, and my question to her is what role does theater have if you're sitting on this hill in Chapel Hill to help heal your community or help bring this community together? So I guess I'll ask you, what is the role of theater in affecting change? I think it's a critically important because again, you, it goes back to telling stories. It goes back to telling you stories that are about us together and all of the challenges that that presents us with. Um, misinterpretations of points of view. And, you know, we have a tendency to use the classics as a way of trying to address current topics. But my, but for me, if I were to help anybody, I would help them understand that classics have different complexions. Mm -hmm. And so there may be a play written. I, I Every time I have an opportunity to talk to somebody about theater, I bring up the name of Alice Childress. Um, who is a phenomenal 20th century African-American playwright. And um, if you listen to my most recent episode of my podcast, you'll find out that she was, she had an opportunity to have her play on Broadway 
three years before A Raisin in the Sun. So that meant that she would have been the first black Af- black woman to be produced on Broadway. Her entire career would have gone in a completely different way than it did. And she declined the offer because the producing offer came with a desire for her to rewrite a section of her play that she was committed to. Her play was Trouble in Mind, and it was about a story of a mixed cast, a, a whites and blacks coming together, dealing with a sto- dealing with a story supposedly written about civil rights from a white perspective. And in the play, the lead actress uh, has to give her son, who is fighting for his right to vote before the Voting Rights Act, he's fighting for his right to vote. He, she, a mob comes to their house demanding him be returned over to them because they intend on lynching him. The mother gives her son up to the mob and the actress questions that action by the mother. Mm-hmm. And she continues to question it through the course of the rehearsal until the white director blows up at her. And he has this long monologue where he runs down the, the, the basic patronizing attitudes of whites in the, in, in the theater towards black stories and black actors, towards the impressions that a white audience has uh, towards black, trying to create imp- sympathy, not empathy, sympathy on the part of a white audience for the plight of these poor black characters. And it, what eventually happened is it blows up the entire uh, rehearsal. The show, he walks out of rehearsal. Um, don't know if the show's still on. But, it, but she refused to change that because she said from her experience that all those things that he said were accurate impressions on the part of people she worked with to get this show up. Mm. And so she lost out on a shot to become famous. And I have to, I have to applaud somebody with that kind of bravery. And conviction, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And so if that's the classics that we're talking about, we can look at that story and we can see how somebody is challenging a compromise situation. We can learn about what it means when varying degrees of perceptions about the world are brought into a a, 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 a melting pot where they ha- where they don't melt together, and we can see how if you have this difficulty telling this story, fictional story on a stage, imagine how difficult it is for people to hold those attitudes and try to live in a civil society. And so if that's the classic that we're talking about, that can talk to our present time, Mm -hmm. right? And still we're talking about a play that was done originally in 1954. Yes. So we don't need to do Shakespeare. We don't need to do the Greeks. We can do somebody who, who lived and wrote in the last century, not that far from where we are right now, who spoke truth. Yeah. Well, and I I think that when we look at classics, um, I think we overlook a lot of classics. (laughs) It goes straight to Shakespeare, straight to those classics, but um, I love that. Maybe maybe that's part of this, is we have to reframe our definition of what classic play is. (laughs) One of the things that, the according to the U.S. Census Bureau, this year, 2020, majority of the children born under the, the majority of children in this country under the age of 18 are going to be of African, Asian, uh, Native, or Latinx descent. That means that the future is going to be much different than we have presently. And if that's the case, shouldn't we be developing our art to reflect that audience of the future. Because otherwise what we're talking about is these art forms becoming dead. And I'm not saying that we have to completely abandon every writer, every um, uh, uh, actor or director that we currently have. What I'm saying is let's add to the list. 
let's ex let's expand it beyond this list. I was I was trying to tell somebody the other day about the list that I was given as a graduate student first day, you know, the reading list, the things that you should know, you know, if you're in the theater program. And I can name I can I can count on this one hand and take away four the three fingers and the thumb and tell you how many black writers were on that list. And that can't that can't continue to happen. You know. Well, and a lot of people say, you know, theater is supposed to mirror our society. You can't mirror our society if you're just telling one type of story. Right, right. If our society is far more um, diverse, if our society lives a different world, uh, lives in a different world, the different ways, not not better or worse, but different than the stories that we're accustomed to telling. How are we serving the the audience of the future? Yeah. Um, I know you work with a lot of young people. I saw some young people on a stage saying they were Gary Anderson. I was fairly certain they weren't. <laughs> I love that video though. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> but you've worked with so many great black artists from George Faison to or Faison to August Wilson, Stephanie Mills. How did working with them inform who you've become as an artist and how you mentor this next generation of black artists? Well my my grandmother marked me early on and said that you can tell Gary, uh, you can always tell Gary but you can't tell them much. <laughs> so that <laughs> she she had a tendency to, to make it clear that I was very stubborn and single-minded. And I really had a desire to uh, pursue a career in the, in the arts. Originally, I was going to be an actor. And I always thought that it was important for me to connect with people at every level. So I've been very fortunate in my, in my, my 30 years of doing this. I've been able to connect with some of the folks you talk about, like I, I met and had com lengthy conversations with, with August Wilson, with Lloyd Richards. I worked with George Faison. I did work with Stephanie Mills. I've had an opportunity to meet a lot of phenomenal writers over the course of my career. Directors, we just, uh, last month, we just lost Walter Dallas, who was a phenomenal stage director in his own right. Um, so, I've been very lucky to meet uh, a whole number. And Alice Childress that I just mentioned, uh, my wife was, was responsible for getting her an honorary doctorate at a, at a college in upstate New York. And I tagged along and we, we, hit it, we all hit it off. She fell in love with her and, and myself. And so when, when our first child was born three years later, we got this, we got a pile of children's books that Alice had written and she stayed in contact with us until the day she died. And then her husband stayed in contact with us even after she had passed, after he had remarried. So, I mean, I've been very fortunate. And, and, and the important thing that I've taken away from all of those experiences is understanding that the opportunities that all these people had, the success or failure that they may have had in their lives has helped make the full person. I think we don't always... We don't, we're always willing to celebrate successes. We really aren't willing to celebrate the challenges that, a, that, that someone might have in the context of getting to where they want to be. Because in many cases, you learn from the failures more so than you do from the successes. Because mm -hmm. the successes, you think it's all about you. <laughs> yeah. And the failures, you, you usually believe it ain't about you when it is about you in most cases. But you have to figure out, so how are you going to get through this and how are you going to get over it? You know? I love that. Leslie Odom Jr., I think his book is called Fail Up. And uh -huh. I love that. I love that saying. Um, how can people support Black Theaters Matters website, Plowshares, and tell me about the podcast? <laughs> okay, well, uh, they can support Black Theater Matters by supporting Plowshares. Black Theater Matters is a human... Uh, arts and humanities program of plowshares we keep it up and retain it for the sake of the you know edification of people like you as a resource we found that a number of people around the country within the last two weeks have gone to it 
I mean, like we had in one week, we had unique visitors up towards 10,000, which had not been the case beforehand. And so it's, it's, and it's continuing to do that. So if you support Plowshares Theater, where there's a link, um, I have a, our, have an article out there, how you can support us right now. You can support Plowshares by, you can support Black Theater Matters by supporting Plowshares. And there's a link that can send you right to a donation. I also have in that list, of all those theaters, you can find out ways to support them as well. And the, all these theater companies are listed. And so you can go to their individual websites, or in some cases they are connected with some other organization, but you can find a way of directing a donation to the ones that you care about. Um, so that's how you help. You know, resources are critically important at this time, specifically with us, you know, ooh, Plowshares itself is probably not looking to mount a show on a stage until the spring of next year. Um, so that means that we're gonna be dark on stages for the remainder of this year and, and the, probably the first quarter of next year. So um, re charitable donations are greatly accepted. You know, they, we, we're trying to do a lot of fundraising right now to raise dollars so we can continue to stay afloat. And all of these black theaters that I've been talking about are gonna, they're really going to be, they're really going to need those resources, like the Ensemble Theater, like the Billy Holiday in Brooklyn, like mm -hmm. Crossroads in, in, in New Brunswick, New Jersey. You know, they're going to need those dollars to help them s get through this moment. Absolutely. And we've put a link on our website, too, to the um, 12 Black theater companies in this area with links to their donation buttons. So. So support black theater is what the overall <laughs> right, right. Uh, theme of this. Um, tell me about the podcast. Did the podcast just launch? Yeah, it just launched at the end of May. Um, it's designed. Yeah, yeah. It the the website had been up since, like you said, 2016. But I found that that it might it that the present moment called for something different. And again, this is part of Plowshares initiative to take a lot of its programming online. So the podcast is just one part of that. So Black Theater Matters addresses issues of importance and relevance to Black theater. Um, so the first few episodes have been me uh, delivering a, um, a lecture, not so much a lecture, but a conversation about a certain aspect. Um, next week, we're going to be doing inter beginning interviews with representatives from organizations around the country. Um, we're going to be, we're going to showcase a interview with the founders of Black Lives Black Words, which is a literary uh, playwriting group that is situated in Chicago. Um, they are a phenomenal group and they're good. And so both the, they're the two leaders of that organization are going to be interviewed, going to be on an interview, um, not this coming Monday, but a week from Monday. So the podcast drops on Mondays? It drops on, it usually drops on Mondays, sometimes early Tuesday, <laughs> but, but, but it, um, it's, it's bi-weekly. Bi-weekly. Okay. So, so, and I will put the link to that as well Thank in you. Um, notes of this video, because um, I want people to listen. This is how we educate ourselves. So. Right. Um, thank you so much, Gary, for spending this time with me. I will come to um, Detroit and hopefully be able to attend a production when we get on the other side of this. I'm not coming in the winter. I told you. I'm not <laughs> well, we won't be doing anything in the winter. I'm not coming for the Thanksgiving parade ever again. Never been so cold in my life. But um, I, I'll come at another time and see a show. That sounds great. I would welcome you. I appreciate that. That'd be very kind of you. Well, I would love that. And thank you so much for spending time with me. Um, I would encourage everyone come back and join us at 730. Um, Aya Wallace and a new panel of diverse artists, black and white artists from our community. They will be continuing the conversation we started last week, theater on races, negativity, torn. So that torn panel will continue at 730 tonight right here on Facebook Live. Thank you, Gary. I will send you the link once I get this video ready fantastic. And, and posted. And I hope to meet you. Maybe a Black I, Theater 
<laughs> I look forward to it. Thank you so much. And um, I'll see everyone in a little while. <laughs> All right. Take it easy. Bye-bye. You too.